And now let's talk about mounts. Of the three components of the system, this may be the most important one. Why? Because when you're observing, if there's any jiggle in the telescope, then it will become difficult to see what you're looking for in the sky. For that reason, you need to have a very sturdy mount. As well, if you're interested in doing astroimaging, there are some kinds of mounts that are suitable for that and others that are not. There are two common types of mounts. There are alt-azimuth mounts and there are German equatorial mounts. Now alt-azimuth stands for altitude and azimuth and that means the mount will move the telescope in two directions. One azimuth means it will move it back and forth like this and alt or altitude means it will change the altitude of your observing it moves it up and down like that. Now it is sometimes hard to recognize an alt azimuth mount because they come in very many shapes. This small mount also is an alt azimuth mount. Though it's a fork mount, but as you can see it only moves azimuth and alt as well. Another common form of the alt azimuth mount is known as a Dobsonian mount. John Dobson in 1965 invented this relatively stable but inexpensive mount that clearly revolutionized uh, amateur astronomy. It made what previously would have been too expensive, highly unaccessible mounts very accessible. It's very simple, uh, made of particle board and uh, easy to transport, easy to set up and yet so robust that you can put very large telescopes on it. And as you can see, it moves alt and, sorry, alt up and down and azimuth are the only two directions it will move. I'll come back to this later. A common kind of mount that you still see in stores is a fork mount like this. You can see that the components of this are not particularly robust. And that means that when I hit this telescope, you can see that it jiggles quite a bit. No matter how hard I tighten all of these screws, you're still going to get some jiggle. Now part of the problem is that you can see this is a very long telescope. The longer the telescope, you get more leverage and it's easier to make it jiggle. Now for observing, this is probably not too bad, as long as you're very careful when you put your eye to the eyepiece. But you can see that just touching it here, it jiggles. So, if you're going to buy a system, be sure to check it out first with the largest telescope that you might have, or consider putting on it, and to see if you get this kind of jiggle. If you get this kind of jiggle, you might want to pass this one by. A design that has, seems to have replaced the fork mount for relatively inexpensive telescopes is something like this. And so it's an alt azimuth, and it has screws to tie everything down tight. And you think, well, this might be a good system. It looks much more modern than what you saw just a moment ago. But there's a major flaw in the design of these mounts. And that is they're hinged at the bottom. There are several versions of this and you might not recognize them. I have a picture of one I'll show you. And, uh, and what happens is this. If you're looking at something on the land, no problem. But that's not usually where we're looking. We're looking in the sky. So as we tip back like this, what happens is that all the weight is shifted to the back. It's all down here. And no matter how hard you keep your eye on the target and try to tighten this up, you're not likely to stay on target. Now I know some people use this telescope and have little problem with it. Others, I know, have adjusted this by adding weights to the front of this that they adjust as they go back to keep the weight on both sides equal, making it a lot easier to tighten this up while you're still on target. Uh, but for most of us, we're not going to do that. And so, I don't necessarily recommend this one as an mount to purchase simply because of this problem. And so, look out for mounts that have the hinge down here. Uh, a friend of mine bought another model like this, and when he takes his telescope out, he takes a large wrench with him. 
and there's a big nut right there and he has to tighten that up with his wrench before he can stay focused on the object he's looking at. Earlier I mentioned Dobsonian mounts. Let me show you why they kind of revolutionized uh, observing for amateur astronomers. Here's how you set one up. There is the mount and tripod. There's the telescope. Normally you'll have a couple of flanges over here to tighten up. But now we're ready to go. That's how easy it is. Uh, it very simply rotates. So what you do is you find your object in the night sky, zero in on it, have your eyepiece set to go. You're looking through it and as the earth turns, you kind of push this along easily. So it rotates easily by just pushing it, and that way you can track the object that you're looking at. The object will usually stay in your view for two minutes, moving from one side of the view to the other. So it's not hard to keep track of the object by just simply pushing this along. Now you can buy a motorized version of this with GoTo, but the basic model without GoTo gives you the best bang for your buck. It handles the largest aperture telescopes at minimum cost. Now, Dobsonian mounts come in many shapes and sizes. They also come in tabletop design. Now, if you'll remember, this tube was on a Y fork previously, and I did not find that suitable. So one day I went out and spent about $40 on a little bit of plumbing a little bit of plywood. In a couple of hours I put together a Dobsonian mount which has proven to be far more solid than the original mount. If you're interested in doing astrophotography I would not recommend buying an alt azimuth mount. You're going to want to have longer exposure for most objects. So what is a German equatorial mount? Well I have two examples here because often when people buy their first telescope, they may find that this is an option that they have. <clears throat> These are either a CG2 or a CG3. And they're quite small, as you can see. So if you see one of these with a big telescope up here, don't buy it. However, if there's a small telescope like this one, very light, only weighs a couple of pounds, then this will probably work just fine. So how does it work? Well, the way it works is it has this axis along here, which you point directly at the North Star. Now I say the North Star because if you're observing, that's close enough. And a lot of the German equatorial mounts have a telescope right through the center here that it allows you to find the North Star and position it so it's pointing directly in the right direction. Once you have it set up and pointed in the right direction, then you look for the object that you want to view. And you do that uh, by uh, rotating, oh, here we go, by rotating this either this way and then perhaps this way. Once you have the object in your view, however, uh, you can simply turn this knob slowly and keep the object in your view. With the Dobsonian, we were just pushing it along. Here you have a little bit more control because it's a little easier to turn this knob and be very, very accurate in terms of tracking the object you're looking at. And in fact, you can be looking through here and turning this knob carefully as you go and keeping it centered in your view. So as I say, this is the most basic type. It's not bad uh, for small telescopes. So here we have the next step up in terms of a German equatorial mount. This is, I've had this for a long time. It for a long time was my travel scope. So it's traveled all through New Zealand, Australia, and Mongolia. And as a consequence, it's quite banged up. But you know, even after all that, it still operates very well. And it has most of the main features that you'll find in a much larger German equatorial mount. So it's go-to, 
It has motors that uh, allow it to track objects in the sky. And I've been able to put on a telescope here which is excellent for astro imaging and I've taken some great astro imaging images all around the world. So this is also something at a level where people will likely purchase a German equatorial mount. In the old days this one would come with handles and you would be able to turn it and track the uh, objects in the sky manually. <clears throat> Today I doubt very many people would buy that configuration. Most people buy it as a go-to. That is, it comes with a handset that allows you to specify what you're looking for after you set it up and motors that keep track of the object once you're on target. This one has a small telescope right through this axis that allows me to align it very well with uh, the North Star or actually the Celestial North Pole. Once that happens, I can use the handpiece to set up the mount so that it knows where to look when I want to find an object. This can operate off of battery power, but usually we either have a large battery underneath that we plug it into, or I actually have a long extension cord that goes out to my observatory. Now when you purchase a German equatorial mount, they come rated in terms of load capacity. This one, I believe, has a limit of something like 11 to 15 pounds. Bigger ones, 20 to 25, and even bigger, 50, 50 pounds. However, if the limit is, let's say, 15 pounds, you probably don't want to put more than 10 pounds worth of optical tube and accessories on the mount. So, once this is set up, as I showed you before, this part points at the uh, North Celestial Pole. You find the object and it tracks it as it goes around. German equatorial mounts come with counterweights usually, and uh, so it's easy to recognize them. Their use in finding objects if you're not using the go-to feature is a little bit more complicated than it is with an alt azimuth telescope and for that reason it's often better to go with the alt azimuth if all you're going to do is observing. If you decide you want a large telescope then you're going to have to buy a large mount. By large telescope I mean something like this. This is a large 8 inch mid cast an 8 inch Newtonian or something larger, you're going to want a large mount. Now we're getting into thousand dollars or more easily and uh, as a consequence uh, I can't tell you how to buy one of these. You're going to have to look it up on the internet and talk to a reliable retailer who knows all about telescopes and and you can spend some time, as I say, on the internet checking it out. This one is, has all the functionality that this one does, a little bit more perhaps, but basically they're the same. The big difference is that it's probably more accurate in tracking and can take a larger telescope. There's a new kind of mount that's available for those who are interested in astro imaging and taking small telescopes with them when they travel. This is the basic unit here, comes with this adapter which you can screw into an ordinary tripod and then you can point it at, well depending on where you are, but here in Halifax it would be 45 degrees, so it's pointed at the North Star and then you can mount this, there we go, there's actually a small telescope here so you can make sure you're pointed directly at the North Celestial Pole. Once you have that set up, you can attach this little piece of equipment. And now if you have a small telescope, you can attach that. You can attach your camera here or if you wish, you can attach your camera here. There we go. And normally we would have a lens on it. 
and this is all powered by batteries and you can have a lot of different settings here but usually I just use it cider oil that is tracking the movement of stars in the sky and you can even set up with a cable here to a cable release to take uh, photogra several photographs but um, I usually use my own release and take a series of pictures that I use then to create an image. There are probably over half a dozen of these available on different brands available on the market right now so it's a rapidly expanding technology and uh, it's exciting because as I say I used to take my other telescope with me but it was big bulky ended up being 50 pounds of material. This one with this but a uh, tripod is light, easy to set up, and I found it to be extremely effective in taking pictures. I can show you some of my photographs I took from Griffith in Australia, out in the outback of the large and small Magellan clouds using this camera, this little tripod, uh, sorry, this tripod, this little mount, and a Canon 100 macro lens. So there's a lot of opportunity here and you can get beautiful wide field shots of the night sky and the objects that are up there using something as simple as this. They're not necessarily cheap. I think this is $400 plus. There's a great variety of them, variety of them up there, out there so you, uh, you have lots to choose from. Anyway, this is a, a good advancement and if you're a person like me who travels a lot this is great to take something like this along with you so that you can take pictures and also I take my small telescope that I showed you before that was on the tabletop telescope and it can actually fit on here at the same time as the camera and uh, you can use it for guiding which this will do or um, you can uh, just observe the objects that you want to see in the night sky.